Hello everybody and welcome to a video about Dwarf Fortress. This is a short tutorial about preparing carefully, with the goal of explaining everything that you need to know, at least for the basics, of preparing carefully in Dwarf Fortress. We're going to go over embarking, a few different mechanics, explaining what a few things mean, and do our best to have you set up and prepared to embark carefully. Now keep in mind, if you're a new player at the game, I recommend leaving the tutorial on and just clicking the play now button. Don't worry about preparing carefully, because a lot of this stuff isn't needed. This video is going to include some tips, how I usually embark, as well as what all of the tools and buttons mean, and what you can do with them, and the powers of them. So, we're going to start off by embarking. This is a rather large world that I've generated. It's 50 years old, with a whole large number of civilizations. So I've kind of selected a neat spot that I would like to embark, but I'm going to explain a little bit about what everything means before I do that. So, since we're looking at the world map here, Assuming you've played through the basic tutorial, you probably have a decent idea of what all this means. You see, we have vil we have little villages around, little towns of dwarves and elves and humans, alongside of uh, these lovely, beautiful mountain homes up here in the mountains. We have various different biomes, from uh, these tropical shrublands to these mountains, all the way down to these temperate, joyous savannas, uh, with deep wilds of swamps and various haunted areas that are maybe a little bit darker or more brooding. Up in the north here, as you can see, we have these glorious taigas and glaciers and amazing places to settle. So something that I always recommend you start off with first when choosing a, a place to embark is selecting your faction. So here we have this list of different dwarven factions that we can play as. If you want to read more about them, you can do that via legends mode before you get to this screen. But that's another video. I already have a video on that if you would like to explore that further. Um, but we have the Staff of Flames, the Coastal Fountains, and the Red Mechanism. So why do you want to select your faction and kind of have an idea of where they are before you embark? Well, it's because certain areas are locked off from certain factions. So let's just say you select the Squeezing Channel, which has one fortress to their name, very, very small little faction, and then decide to settle on this island right here. Well, you're going to have a hard time because they're not going to be able to reach you. And you're not going to get as many migrants, you won't get traders, and things of that sort. So, it is wise to select a faction that is in general proximity of where you are settling in Dwarf Fortress. So for this particular video, I've selected the Greater Iron, just because I really like taiga biomes and I like having seasons. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be selecting... Uh, an area kind of in this general vicinity, close to the Greater Iron. They have a good number of fortresses. There isn't a huge number of threats nearby. If I go and look at these neighbors, as you can see, there are elves nearby, you know, about a day, one and a half day, days travel away. Uh, there are humans, that is a day's travel, that are hostile, that we're currently at war with, alongside of goblins, which are a day's travel to the northwest. Not hostile yet, but could very well become hostile in the future. So I kind of like this side over here, not too far away from everything. The nearest hostile faction is two days away, so we're going to kind of zoom in here. Now that we're zoomed in by clicking the left mouse button, we have two different options down here that are very important, as well as a lot of information up here that is very important. So the information that we have to look at here is show cliffs and grades. This is going to show us the steepness and the vertical nature of the surrounding cliffs. So an area like this, very, very steep, while as the green is much more flat, as you can see. The kind of sharper the angle, the steeper the elevate the cliffs and grade of the of the areas. Now, the other button we have here is show elevation. Elevation shows the general elevation of an area. So as you can see, there's kind of like sloping downhills, the lighter the color, the lower the elevation, the grayer the color, the higher elevation. Now remember, you cannot embark directly on mountains, at least without mods, so a lot of these pure gray areas are kind of off-limits, or rather these little mountain icons here are off-limits. However, you can still settle partially on mountains, so you could theoretically settle around here. So if I turn this off, we can kind of have a look, see, around the cliffs and elevation. I'm a big fan of kind of the elevation in this little spot, but I also, as I said earlier, I'm a big fan of taiga, so this is a really nice area right here that I'm kind of fond of. O right over here, uh, you can see uh, there is uh, Rampart uh, tunneled the Dwarven Mountain Halls, which is part of our faction, so we're settling right next door to our friends. So what we're aiming to do here is we're aiming to find a spot that has some interesting stuff for us to mess with close by for e eventual fun, alongside of making sure that the biome suits our needs. So we're going to zoom in here and kind of look around this 
cliff area because everything's a reasonable distance away. I'm not seeing any aquifers. Aquifers are useful in the current game, actually. Just make sure you don't settle on a heavy aquifer, but getting through them can still be annoying, so we're just going to avoid that entirely here. So let's just have a peek around. We have uh, iron, gold, copper, nickel, platinum, and, and tin and lead. Not bad. A very wide variety of metals. Uh, so the fact that we've got little soil, eh, the lack of soil is kind of hurting me here. Um, we can increase the size of our embark location or lower the size of our embark location. If you're on a weaker PC, I do recommend doing like a 3x3 or a 2x2 embark. But on most normal um, average computers these days, you can run on a 4x4. You can increase this number up to 6x6, but keep in mind, if you go with these very large embarks, you will experience lag. It's kind of like playing City Skylines with the all unlock all tiles mod. Eventually the game's just going to run slowly. It's just kind of a matter of course. So I'm really liking this zone right here. We get a little bit of mountain. We get some uh, vertical uh, stuff. We get some taiga as well as these lovely temperate conifer forests. Uh, everything here is cold. The surroundings are calm, so it's not going to be too difficult. The general difficulty of a region is dependent on your neighbors and the surrounding wildernesses. So the calm note there is very important. If an area is maybe untamed wilds or wilderness, you're going to get a much harsher zone. Now keep in mind, we do have trees down in this conifer forest as well as in the taiga, but the mountains have no trees, okay? Um, each one of these different biomes is going to have a different amount of metals, so we kind of want to check them all and do a little scan here just to have a pretty good idea of what we're in for. So I'm quite liking this embark spot right here, so we're going to click it. Now, the game gives us a few different options here. There's uh, enemies off, normal and hard, so if you just want to chill, not fight anything, and just like basically have a creative Minecraft style of experience, I recommend turning enemies off. However, if you're down for fun, crank it all the way up to hard, and you'll get some pretty mean things pretty quickly. The game will be notified of your existence immediately, and you'll have to deal with threats very quickly. As for, as a, as for economy, uh, I, I will be completely honest, I haven't had enough time with this version of the game to really know how that changes things. Considering the economy has been completely rebalanced, that's something for another video in the custom settings there. Um, so now... Recommended for new players, just click play now and don't worry too much, but we're going to prepare for this journey carefully. So this gives us a list of dwarves over here on the left, and then a list of skills over here on the right. Now, there's a few important tabs that we're going to cover in this menu really quickly. So over on the left, we have dwarves. These are the seven dwarves that we're going to be starting with. We can view their thoughts. We can look at their personalities. Consider this like your character creator for an RPG. This is where you're going to sit down and go, all right, what theme do I want for this embark? What kind of character do I want this fortress to be? How do I want to build my, and design this setup? You can go through the items that they're going to be starting with. These can't be edited or changed. We can look at their health, although because these are brand new dwarves uh, that have been snapped into existence for the purpose of creating this fortress, they, they have no health issues. Same, and their skills have not been selected yet, although we do know that this dwarf is a novice, is a competent dancer and a novice musician and a wind instrumentalist, very much a hobbyist. And uh, they have the knowledge of the musical form, the pregnancy of couples, all right, and uh, the musical form, the lyrics of adoring. Um, and then over here, like, of course, they have nothing yet. Uh, we can look at their personality. We can look at their thoughts, which they don't have any yet because they don't exist yet. And um, we know that they are a citizen of the Greater Iron, which is the faction that we selected. And of course, uh, the god that they worship and their friends. We'll learn more about the god once you get in game, but again, topic for a different video. So now that we've looked at a dwarf's thoughts, we can then click back over to their skills tab. So because these dwarves are all listed as peasants, it means they have no skills at the beginning. So what I generally do when I embark personally is I just go with seven peasants and then assign skills once I'm in game and they learn pretty quickly. But especially if you're settling in a harder biome, it's wise to start off with a few points in mining on one dwarf. It's wise to start off with a few points in uh, wood cutting or carpentry just to get better quality beds off the bat. It's also wise to start off with um, a mason. So we're going to do a little bit of skill assigning in a moment after we finish covering the rest of this UI. Over here, we have items. Now this screen looks a little bit daunting initially. However, it's really not that bad. Over here on the left, uh, we see our total points 
for the items that we are currently bringing. So these are your, this is your default Embark uh, profile. This is everything that you need to start a fortress with minimal issue. You know, a wheelbarrow, a step ladder, uh, some crutches in case there's injuries, same with splints, a couple buckets, which are used for bringing water to people who have injuries, um, some quivers for hunting, uh, some ropes, uh, which are used for making wells, wells or making uh, uh, like uh, prisons, prison cells. Um, we have pigtail thread, which is used for making cloth or stitching up wounds. We have pigtail bags, which is uh, just literal cloth bags used for storing seeds generally. Some pond turtle. Now these aren't living. This is food. Um, plump helmets. Those can be brewed into alcohol or food. Uh, we have ren uh, worm meat. I almost read that as ren meat. Worm meat, which is just meat. Um, and then, of course, we have some dwarven ale, some dwarven beer, two picks, Two, co two battle axes, which are used for chopping down wood, an iron anvil, very important for dwarfy things, our necessary seeds, and some cloth. Now, we have 500 points to spend. Those points go towards our citizens' skills, the items that we bring, and the animals that we bring. So, over here, this is our inventory that we're going to be embarking with, or would be embarking with if we embark with this exact inventory. In the center here are all of the different categories of things that we could bring. And over here, currently selected, is leather. Using this window, we can search for, let's just say, um, I, well, I mean, up at the top is bobcat leather. So you could, so if you're looking for a particular type of leather, leather to bring with, you could do that. Um, if we go through, we can see uh, the different cloths we could bring, the different crafts we could bring, which would be a little bit redundant, uh, the different types of wood we could bring, metal bars. Maybe we want to start without any pickaxes or uh, battle axes for a little added challenge and make our own bars off the bat. Uh, we could bring some gems. We could bring some cut some large gems. Uh, we could bring stone blocks. Again, anvils. We can see that our faction has access to steel, so we could bring an iron anvil, or we could uh, sacrifice some points for a steel anvil, which would make the dwarves real happy if they get to use that early on, as well as weapons and all of the other different categories. Now, personally, I don't recommend messing with this too much, at least from a beginner's perspective. Um... You can just leave this entirely default and do just fine. That's something that I just want to say pretty bluntly. When you're messing around with this game initially, you don't want to be changing this too much. However, something that I generally do is I often will bring a little bit of extra alcohol just purely so that I don't need to worry about brewing booze as quickly. I want to make it at least to fall uh, on my initial beer stash. Now, since dwarves only have to drink every couple of weeks in-game, and it's a good, like, six months before the first trade caravan comes by, you have a pretty healthy amount of time with of not having to worry about brewing booze. So usually I'll just crank these up to about 60 apiece and just kind of not worry about it too much. And then we're going to move over to the animals tab after I increase our initial beer bring along. So that's going to spend a couple points. And also just for good measure, I'm also going to bring a little bit of extra food. Although food is very easy to access once in game, but that's for another video. Over here, we have animals. So by default, we're not bringing any animals with us. Now, here you have the opportunity to bring different animals with you. Uh, this is all of the stuff that my faction has access to. We have, of course, young and old variants of all of these different animals. So there's like, you know, uh, lambs and rams and lambs and uh, and uh, iwis, which I, I, I've been told I pronounce incorrectly. We have pigs and sows. Uh, we have piglets, of course, as well, uh, both male and female variants. And uh, for some reason, they haven't given us a search tab on this screen, which I, I think is a little strange, personally, if you had to ask me. Uh, of course, we also have drakes, which is now spoiled. In the old game, a lot of people used to assume that drakes were dragons initially, not knowing that it's actually a word for mallard. Uh, but uh, that's a male duck we could bring. Um, I like to uh, embark with a couple turkeys, usually, because uh, turkeys uh, give leather as well as a healthy supply of eggs. And all that they require is being put into a pasture zone and being left near a nest box. So I'm going to bring a couple of turkey hens, let's say three of them, and one turkey gobbler, just so that we can make more turkeys because uh, infinitely multiplying turkeys is generally a positive if you are farming turkeys. Um, a lot of people will recommend bringing cats with as they will stop uh, your food from being eaten by... Um, uh, uh, vermin, like rats and mice and such, but in my experience bringing cats early just kind of leads to a lot of garbage everywhere, and the amount that the vermin actually eat is small enough that you don't need to worry about it early, uh, and migrants will bring cats. So instead of that, I'm simply going to bring with two uh, dogs, which we're going to train for hunt, which I would train for hunting dogs. 
The next thing we're going to do is jump back over to our dwarves. Now, here that we're looking at our dwarves again, we can go through the skills that we want. So, as I mentioned before, it's wise to put a bunch of skills in early game, because then you don't need to worry about assigning stuff right when you settle. So, we're going to add a couple points to our first dwarf and give them a little bit of mining. The second dwarf, we're going to give them one point in woodcutting and one point in carpentry. Right off the bat, that this dwarf is going to go and grab... Uh, a, a, a axe and will immediately start chopping down wood for us without us needing to worry about assigning those skills because that is the benefit of this instead of having to you know assign the different job profiles to your dwarves all you need to do is just give them the command and they just get right to it the next thing that I usually give to my next dwarf is a couple more points in mining because it's good to have two miners we do have two, two picks after all might as well have two miners right now, the next thing that I, I always recommend is bring a mason with you because you're going to start needing to make uh, thrones, you're going to need to make tables, you're going to make need to make doors, and you're probably going to start working on blocks. Unless you're settling somewhere strange without any stone, it's a generally a good idea to bring a dwarf with at least some skill in masonry. Now, unless you're planning on starting off with uh, blacksmithing super early, you don't necessarily need to bring a blacksmith, but for the sake of this video, I'm going to give a dwarf two points in blacksmithing, and two points in weaponsmithing. Uh, the next thing that I would recommend bringing with is a brewer slash planter dwarf, because planting is actually quite an important skill. It's not hard to train, it's something that dwarves train quite quickly, but it is a rather important skill to get the most out of your farm plots. So I'm going to just put uh, two points and make a salon here into a farmer. Now, as you can see, there are plenty of points left over. At that point, it, this is all just up to you what you want to throw different points into, right? These are the, your crucial skills up at the top. Your 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 carving, your your crafting, your farming, your carpentry, your mining. But we also have some more interesting skills. We have mechanics, we have pottery, we have glazing, paper making, book binders and wax workers. Honeybee wax for reference. These uh, alternative jobs are also very useful. I'm going to throw a couple of points on this farmer into uh, herbalist. Because you want somebody to be able to run around and gather stuff for you, right? Now, the last one that we're looking at is kind of our other dwarf, right? We have one dwarf left. If we want some uh, assistance early, because we only have one woodcutting dwarf, we could chuck a couple points into Axe Dwarf and make Domas our, our military chief. Or perhaps uh, we could go into a more specialized labor. Perhaps we want a, a specialized tanner right off the bat. Those turkeys will be producing leather after all. You have a lot of decisions here, and it is up to you. But, oh, at least initially, the only thing you really need to worry about are these crucial skills. But for this particular dwarf, let's we'll just leave them as kind of a general laborer, I think. So I'm going to give them uh, a point in weaving. I'm going to give them a point in cooking. And I'm going to give them a point in, uh, where did it go? Uh, mechanics. And uh, I'm going to give them a point in tanning so that we can get some better uh, animal skin quality made into leather. Now, we can look at combat skills, of course. Uh, there are some pretty sneaky stuff you... There are some pretty sne sneaky things you could do with these combat and other skills. Um, you could bring a doctor with. Uh, maybe you want to be super cheesy and flood your... And you're planning on flooding your fort. You could then bring a swimmer, okay? So, that is kind of the extent of these more role play uh, further off skills that maybe, you know, making a dwarf a very talented poet, while it might be fun, uh, certainly not the most important thing for the long-term survival of your fort. Same with things like wordsmith and writing. Uh, those you can essentially ignore. So, all of that aside, now that we've selected our dwarves, we've increased some points in our uh, embark stuff. I think we can put some more points into our beer, and I think we can put some more points into our ale. We're going to scroll down a little bit. Plump helmets are only harvestable in the cavern layers. And uh, they while they can be grown elsewhere, they grow optimally in the cavern layers. So we're not going to be getting more plump helmets unless we decide to do a shallow garden of them or until we hit the caverns. So what I'm going to recommend we do here is increase the plump helmet count just a little bit because as you can see, we still have plenty of points left. We're also going to scroll down a little bit and I'm going to bring with an extra wheelbarrow. Just to kill some more points off, we're going to bring with uh, an extra axe, an extra pick, and 
an extra anvil. So that's going to clear a lot of points. This is going to give us a very safe and easy embark. Now, these are seeds for planting. And because we're not going to be getting plump helmets for a while, I'm going to increase the plump helmet count. Keep in mind that every single consumed, eaten plump helmet from down here will turn into a plump helmet spawn unless it's cooked. So it's a very good idea to remove plump helmet cooking from the kitchen menu, but we'll worry about that later. So for now, we have a pretty good amount of things that we are bringing with. Uh, we're going to jump back over to the animals because this is a good way to use up the rest of our points. And I think we're going to bring with uh, a couple of uh, cattle. Eh, actually, no, nah, instead of cattle, uh, let's, let's do sheep. Let's do uh, two lamb or a lamb. And uh, yeah, because I only have 32 points after that. Let's do a lamb and then spend the rest on turkeys. Let's bring a couple more turkey hens, a couple more gobblers. And uh, actually, you know, let's let's knock out two of those. I'm gonna bring with another dog, but I don't quite have enough points. Eh, we'll just bring with another turkey hen and then jump over here to uh, beer and then increase the last and just file out the last of those points. So we could spend a lot more making our dwarves super skilled, but like I said, they will train up pretty quickly once we in-game. So we can save this profile if I want to be able to select it again next time. Um, then from there, we can go into fortresses. So I'm gonna click on fortress name. Um, this allows us to select what our fortress is going to be called. Now, Rift Gravel is the default name. So we have several options here. We can hit random a couple of times, like free whips. Free whips excite me. Uh, arch bridges. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Rampart masters. Of course, you could just leave this all the way up to chance. Um, we can add in adjectives here. Uh, and these are all translated into the Dwarven language, meaning like your choice of words is actually a little bit limited. However, um, it, considering this game has randomly generated the name for a fortress, Bulbous Soar, for me before, um, you can get some pretty interesting combinations. So I'm going to hit random a couple times over here um, until we get something I like. Let's go with Glaze Routes. So now we've selected the name Glaze Routes. From here, we can go to our group name. All of this, by the way, for clarity's sake, is completely irrelevant. It is purely roleplay purposes. That's what we've gotten to at this point with this. Uh, we're going to look at our group name. So this is the name of the local government. This is what other factions are going to know us as. So we're going to be the fortress of uh, Glaze Routes of the local dwarven government, the ancient hammer. Now, what would the image of the ancient hammer be? Again, this is all for roleplay purposes. So let's go to an object. Uh, let's go to an object and type in hammer. Uh, a hammer, a so hammer. So these are all instrument pieces. Okay, okay, okay. Let's, let's, let's go uh, war hammer. Uh, perfect. Uh, a war hammer. So this is the image of a war hammer. All right. Let's, let's say an image of a war hammer and a, uh, and a dwarf. Um, the and a dwarf yes uh the the dwarf is raising uh, or i uh, know let's say the dwarf is embracing embracing the warhammer um and we're going to remove the element that i accidentally added here which is this one so this is an image of a warhammer and a dwarf the dwarf is embracing the warhammer the symbol of the greater iron so this is the symbol of our faction um and uh we're going to keep working and then from there click done so, we now have a name. We are the Fortress of Glaze Routes. We have a group. We are the Ancient Hammer. We have a group symbol, which is uh, an image of a Warhammer and a dwarf, and the dwarf is embracing the Warhammer. And we have our labors selected, we have our items selected, and we have our animals selected. And then from there, once again, we can save the embark, or we can just click embark, which is, I think, what we're going to do. And then it says, you have 47 unpicked skills because we haven't filled out all the doors because we opted to bring more items instead. And that is okay. And from there you click, I'm ready. I hope this video was helpful to you. That was my video on preparing carefully in Dwarf Fortress. I also have a video on Legends mode and I'm working on some other things as well. If you want to see more videos on uh, of Dwarf Fortress, you can check out my YouTube channel where I have more Dwarf Fortress than you could reasonably watch in a lifetime. And if you want to see me play games live, mostly Dwarf Fortress, but sometimes other things, you can go over to twitch.tv slash blindirl for more of this kind of thing. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the next one.